Um, this is the Goat Lodge, and we have Waylon on the line. We're going to get into some interesting stuff this evening about the old ones, uh, cosmology. Um, and how it entails with the numinous. Numinous. Oh, yeah. Void, astral, different different cosmology. Uh, Waylon, oh. um, so uh, what I'd like to... So my first question, um, just you can get into this however you want to, but I want, like, let's talk about the origins of all this shit. I mean, where did the origins of uh, beings like Pazuzu, Ariman, and uh, Yog sothoth Cthulhu, where, where did these beings come from? Well, uh, that, is, that is a very deep question. I cannot tell you where... Every single one of them came from, you know, like in the case of Aramon, we know the myth. Uh, as far as Pazuzu, that's long lost, forgotten. However, you can pretty much put it, put that de that being right up there with the old ones, uh, maybe a progeny of them. Uh, but basically, as long as man's been alive, man has tried to understand stuff. And when man tries to understand stuff, the only way that he can rationalize or, you know, his logical mind can comprehend it or understand it is to give it a name. And a name is where it all begins, brother. Mm -hmm. So where do you... Yeah. Know, the very first power was... Go ahead. Um... Just for a couple minutes, can you tell us a little bit about the origin of Arhiman, where some of them impulses came from, um, and what actually is it? Because I know it's completely unlike anything else. It's not. It's not Satan. It's different from. It's different from some of the other devils out there. Way different. Same thing. And I know that it ties into what we're getting into this evening. Right. Uh, well, in the case of Arman, you know, you're talking about Zoroastrianism, where you know they were trying to they were trying to express uh, a singular unity uh, in its di di divided self, as in the form of light and darkness. You know, with Ahura Mazda and Angramanu, and I guess the poster child for that was Ariman as being. Uh, the rebellious fighter that was like, no, I'm going to be born first because I'm going to, I'm going to be the first. I'm, you know, this, that, and the other. It's that, it's that go get them attitude. We find, uh, we find echoes of arm and within ourselves every time you find a distinct uh, pleasure in uh, watching the downfall of your enemies or, or that sense of. Uh, pride and power that comes with having overcome some grand obstacle in your life, some grand achievement, you know. And and so anytime where you're talking about where the will is embodied within the human being and is in action, that is where you will always find the essence of Ariman within humanity. But it was more or less uh like in myth wise, um uh, Ariman was kind of like the, uh, you know, the, you can't have a hero Mazda, the good guy, the the light and the bringer of of goodness and all this that and the other, without having a shadow or shade. It's uh, and even in Middle Eastern thinking, they didn't look at it like like good and evil, uh, right and wrong, shit like that. They just looked at it as the complementary half, you know, kind of like a. a an oriental aspect of yin yang. Uh, so with Ahura Mazda and Manu, they were complementary halves of one another. Because you can't, you can't have, uh, just light without darkness. There must always be a stage of rest as well as a stage of activity. There is that which is seen and that which is unseen. The visible, the invisible, the known, the unknown. Uh, and for every, every act or passionate aspect, of goodness to the utmost degree that you can imagine that there has to be that exact same extreme that is that is supposited within the human consciousness or psyche uh in, in its existence so therefore there was there must always be 
that uh that more aggressive uh anti cosmic nature as opposed to you know the Ahura Mazda of I sing and dance creation into being Ahura Mazda's like, you know, I sit here and I damn your creation, you know. You know, fuck fuck your feebleness, you know. Let me show you true power, let me show you true strength. Because it was equal ferocity, just as Ahura Mazda in splendor and absolute power and authority created everything. You know, Angra Manu and his perfect self of being was the anti-cosmic, uh, you know, the destroyer is what they refer to him as. But more so than a destroyer, he showed that he had the capability uh, for good for good, and for being upright, I think is a better term. If we break away from the philosophical, socialized, uh, politically correct term, we're going to say upright uh, version that Ahura Mazda was. And so what happened was that you have this, uh, this, this destroyer, you know, bringing balance. And, and in that aspect, he created Malak Taos. And Malak Taos, Malak Taos was, was everything. It was Ahura Mazda and it was Angra Manu made into one perfected being greater and better in every sense than either brother ever thought of being. And, you know, and he made it just as a big uh, middle finger up to the world saying, fuck you, yes I can, but hell with you, I don't want to. I like that. I like that. That's very badass, and it just shows that uh, what he's connected to. Uh, Ariman's pulling from the pulling from the void. He's pulling from um, higher than, something higher than that limited light uh, that a Hara Mazda is pulling from his own. Well, I want you. Where I, I want you to think of something. If you have the power, if you have the power to create anything that you want, yeah. I mean anything that you want, imagine if somebody comes along and goes like, well, I'm going to destroy your sandcastle. Okay? Yeah. Well, sandcastle is pretty easy. All you got to do is get up there and start kicking at it, right? Yeah. Well, let's say that you had the power of a Mazda that you can create anything. Okay? Well, not just anybody's going to walk up, you know, and pissing your cornflakes or kick your sandcastle over. No, it had to be someone with equal skill and ability. You know, and that's and that's what Hunger Manu is. See, uh, everybody, they want to focus either completely on the left, completely on the right. But you've just got to understand that they're complementary selves. They're complementary halves. Parts of the... Parts of the whole piece, if that makes any sense. Yeah. And so it would... So because... Anger Manu knew what his brother could do, and yet he, you know, he was not filled with that upright goodness, you know. He was like, yeah, yeah, no thanks, man. You're you're making slaves, and, you know, no thanks. I don't want to be a slave. I'm not going to be your slave, you know, and so forth and so on. And so, and that's how we as humans have classified the way that we think or look at at Ariman or why Ariman does what he does. And this next thing I'm about to say is important for the, for the uh, concept of the old ones when we, go in, when we go into it here in a little bit. But the idea is that that is too simple. We must understand that powers like Ahura Mazda, they were supreme beings. There is no thought, there is no consciousness in the sense of like how we have a conscious like, you know, I'm aware that I'm sitting here talking to you. Or, you know, that it's dark or that it's cold and snowing outside. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, not that kind of consciousness, but like an absolute awareness of self, you know. And and see, Ahura Mazda, in, in it, rather than a he or she or, you know, whatever, Ahura Mazda, just as Ahura Mazda was, the creator that created, that created all things, okay? And then when we go to look at Ariman, Ariman didn't like necessarily go, no, you're making slaves, you know, flip the finger to his brother, you know, and blah, blah, blah. That is stuff that we attribute to these beings uh, so that we can comprehend them, so that we can understand them. Remember earlier I was talking about mankind's need to to understand something, and then when, they, when they're seeking to understand it, they've got to name it. Because naming it, they claim some kind of power, plus they put it in a box inside their head, to where rash, rationally speaking, they, they remain rational. They, you know, when they speak or when they talk about it, it makes sense to others, you know. 
Well, mankind does this because of the way our minds are, are made. But these beings are way beyond that whole, you know, I'm going to destroy your enemies because you're pissed at them and because you're such a great, stu because you're such a great servant of mine. That's not how those powers work, but that's how we keep putting them down in books and pages of paper. This is what we're teaching people, you know, so forth and so on. And it's so much greater than that because these are absolute states of being and we're supposed to mimic them. Because when we light a candle and we call upon Angra Manu, what we are doing is we are, we are devolving. We are descending within the depths of ourself. We are finding that raw, primal, not human, not attached to the flesh. It's not about desires and wants and all this other stuff. But we're reaching even deeper into that, and we're saying, you know, well, I'm sick of this and I'm sick of that. We're tapping into our passion. And in this instance, the anger, and the anger is against the established order that this world has created for us to follow. And so Anger Manu represents that aspect of us that fights against the world that others would have created for us, the roles others give us. And we're sitting there saying, no, fuck you. I will make the world in my own image. And I will do what I want to do when I want to do it. You are not my master. And that's a nod to King Bilal for anybody who will catch that. But with that concept, though, when you do that, you then, in that moment, you become likened unto Angra Manu. And the more you do this, the more you connect with the consciousness and the way our minds are calibrated and the way they were created and the way that they've evolved over time – is we are able to subtly discern messages, knowledge, wisdom from these consciousness, from these intelligences. And, and then we start to learn the mysteries of what these things mean, of why the myths were told and retold and retold and retold. Because in them lie cute, uh, clues and cues on how to tap into the energy structure of that consciousness and become like that consciousness, and the more we seek to emulate that consciousness, we become that being. Yes, and just one more comment on the Arimani current. This symbolism is very fucking powerful there, and I like the idea of counter-creation, because when you counter-create, it's actually a smarter way of doing things, because by destroying things, you're you're expending less energy. So, in a sense, Arimani is actually conserving his energy, and so he has more time to perfect his, all of his schemes and everything like that, while Ahura Mazda is just pulling and pulling out of his own being and just, just creating, creating whatever the fuck, um, order or whatever the fuck, Ariman is creating just by existing, just by being chaotic. Yeah, and I'm, uh, this next thing I'm about to say, I'm not trying to quote myself, but uh, a quote that I use a lot that I came up with a long time ago, was that every act of becoming is preceded by an act of blasphemy. And to ascend, to become, ascend doesn't mean to go to heaven and become some righteous, whatever the fuck. Ascending is, is releasing yourselves from the chains and bonds that have bound you and kept you chained down. The illusion of the physical the illusion of uh, morals, of uh, of even mind. Because see, at a certain point, you have to break past even mind. The mind must not must not exist. There must be not. Nothing must exist. And this is the return to the void. This is the secret doorway into dawn. And when you've achieved that state of mind, then that whole thing. Then you're able to ascend. Then you're able to to take upon yourself your true form, your true face, to know your true name, all this other stuff. And meanwhile, all ritual is supposed to do is to bring you to this point and strengthen it so that even if you have a nine to five or you have a, a marital life or you have to raise children or you have to do this or you have to do that, that you're able to maintain your connection with that state of being until it becomes so emboldened, so strong within you that it's it's no different than opening your eyes when you wake up or closing your eyes when you go to bed. Everything must be seamless and flawless and must flow into one another perfectly, like rivers going into other rivers and streams and tributaries to the main river. 
I am in agreement. Could you tell... Sorry, man, you got me all passionate about this shit. Could you tell me, tell us real quick uh, what you said the other night about um, these these dark, these archetypes. Could you tell us about the primal thirst and these, these, these desires of the void that just originated in there? Uh, you're going to have to refresh my memory, brother. Because that was a few days. I've dealt with a few things since then. <laughs> what can you tell us about you? You call it the primal thirst that these old ones oh. they, they start. They're so hungry, like they're wandering. Oh, the, the thirst! Yeah, yeah, the thirst that cannot be sated. The hunger, the or uh, the thirst that cannot be uh, quenched, and the hunger that cannot be sated. Yes. Yeah, uh, those are natural physical uh, reactions that that the physical body will start to exhibit uh, to where food ha has no flavor. It's like you're, it's almost like being really picky. Want, you know, starving, being hungry, but not knowing what you want or, you know, just nothing's hitting the spot, nothing tastes right. Uh, it's like having something to drink and being like, I don't want that. I want something to drink, but I don't know what it is, you know. And that is a physical manifestation of the concept of what you're referring to, uh, that is awakened once one has delved into the void. Once you've crossed the abyss, once you've passed the veil, what happens is when you go into the nothing itself that is uh, darkly illuminated. I know that that sounds oxymoronish and just, you know, whatever, but it's true. It's, it's a darkly splendid world. It's a world where there's like this just strange glow, but there's no light source, there's nothing in it, and it glows like a, uh, I don't, a weird transition of colors of like a, a, a liquid black or, you know, like a, like a dark, like the darkest violet color you could imagine. And it just seems to, uh, it just seems to come from everywhere and everything. And you'll, you'll know it once you've tapped into the void because all of a sudden that's when you lose 20 minutes of a day, 30 minutes of a day, an hour, two hours, depending on, on how good you are at, at staying in a meditative trance state. But that's usually the doorway to that realm is usually found within vampirism and in certain cases, lycanthropy. And the reason why I say in certain cases lycanthropy, because in lycanthropy, the werewolves would eat the hearts. And so, you know, you know that's food. Uh, I'm not going to get into the to the depths of the meanings of why the heart and so forth and so on. You know, I, I would figure that the squishy bits, because every animal I've ever seen that actually eats flesh, they always eat the soft, squishy bits. Uh, but for the lore of like, of like the lycanthrope, uh, the werewolf, uh, the, the, you know, they would eat the heart and that's the, that's the meat, the food, you know, the, the physical part of it. And then in vampirism, you would have the blood. And so these two, so these two archetypes, these two occult archetypes are literally, uh, the doorways to discovering that thirst or that hunger. And, and if you're seeking to awaken it, you know, I'm seeking to awaken it so that you can have the hardest time of your life of going around hungry and never being filled, th uh, thirsty and never quite getting the right drink. That's not what it's about because anybody that is working to become, become an adept at their craft, become a black adept or whatever the word is that anybody wants to use for it, they're actually using these as venues to fine tune their skills as spiritual predators, you know. And in some cases, yes, physical predators. I mean, it, it just depends on the, on the psyche and the psychological makeup and the balance and imbalance of the individuals that are working these systems and these paths. But, uh, yeah, that... to, the, the deeper concept there actually will lead us further into the conversation that you wanted to have about the old one. So I didn't know how far you want to go with that. Very, um, yeah, I, uh, thank you. You you helped answer my other question because it, it the other night it almost made you sound like it, it almost made it sound like that it was Cthulhu and Arhiman that that was hungry and I was going to ask well I'm no. thirsty for what and when that happened no it's 
the reaction. The it's the reaction of, of your consciousness yeah. interacting with an alien uh, consciousness or intelligence. And by alien, I'm not talking about grays and all of that. No, no. Right. Alien is anything outside of uh, the normal race, uh, right. of the ra like in this case, the race of mankind. Uh, you know, because there are many different species and races of spiritual entities. Okay, good. That, that makes much more sense now. And last part of this question thirsty for what the the flames of the void be all and i think they can um i would question i i think that they can be satiated it would drives us further into the zero further further into the womb until we get that numinous source further into ourselves it it, it, it may seem like an unquenchable thirst at first but it's more like a, maybe a motivation to to get it and then once you've done the fucking work and you've got the fucking gnosis, then you're satiated. Somewhat, not fully, but I like I, I like how you're breaking that down. No, the path never. Uh, ends. so the reason, so the reason why it comes around as uh, as not being able to be quenched or sated, that thirst, that hunger, is because. You haven't learned how to feed properly. And also, food source plays the biggest role ever. Think about it this way. If you're a meat and potatoes kind of guy, drinking milk day in and day out is not going to sate your thirst or your hunger. You know what I'm saying? And so it's kind of like uh, uh, drinking from... Uh, from a very powerful being, if you were a vampire, you had a vampiric nature, and you were to drink from a very powerful being, that would, that would, uh, in the words of the Egyptians, feed your ka. And the feeding of the ka is one of the most important things when it comes to vampirism. Uh, and lycanthropy, they feed the ba. Two different things, but the, but it's all, it's all centered around the same thing. The feeding of the immortal self, which is, which is the soul, which is why so many people work with like Hakate as psychopomp or, you know, work with uh, any any of the deities that lead to, uh, you know, either a Cyrus of the grave, Ma'at as truth holder, and, you know, the judge who weighs the heart against the feather, uh, whether you're talking, uh, oh, let me think here for a second. Holy crap, I don't know. There, there are so many examples that you can use depending on what, you know, what pantheon or mythology that you're working with, you know, because you can, you can apply this to Norse mythology, you can attach this to Celtic mythology. Yeah. I, you, dude, the, the sky's the limit on that. I love, I, I love, um, in the lichen, on the lycanthropic shit, I love that shit. Um, I, I love critter. I love animal mass, critter mass, uh, horn, it's horn skulls, things like that. Working with the yep. critter, the critter self, it, it, it's it's fucking it's fucking amazing. Um, but I'll save that. I'll save the deets on that for another discussion here. But I've got multiple readings from different sorcerers there, and you know why. I, I, I probably more likely to not come from that bloodline. I mean, I've been told by my best friend that I looked like one of my goat, one of my toy goats, like I had a snout on my face. Not physical, but astral. When he saw me through my third eye, it looked like I had a snout on my face. So I, I know that what I've been doing has been working. Well, you mind if I say something real quick? Yeah. Uh. Every time I've ever seen your face, like in video or something like that, or even in picture, uh, the way I see it is that you are still formulating the self, which that's very important. Uh, I'm going to put this out there for your, for your viewers. Uh, the concept of feeding, whether it's through lycanthropy, vampirism, uh, I don't care if it's tendrils, teeth, claws, I don't care how you do it. But the whole concept behind all of it, what what uh, bring coming back to the whole not being sated, not being quenched, you know, you know, just not having the food right or whatever. Some of it is the fact that 
These systems of magic do not teach you how to build a body that is solid and condensed enough that you retain the energy and the power that you are taking from things. This is why people feel like that they're, when, when they are walking the vampiric path or the lycanthropic lifestyle, or uh, and I say lifestyle, I don't mean that disrespectfully. I actually mean that with respect. But those who are living the lifestyle of either, the reason why they keep having to come back to that hunger and come back to that hunger, and sometimes so often, is because the, the spiritual body that, that they are supposed to have crafted before they ever pick these practices up, that was never taught. Everybody's taught to go out and go feeding if you're, you know, no matter what predator style of uh, spiritual type you're following. They tell you to go out and feed, you know. They teach you how to, how to hunt in dreams. They teach you how astral, astral travel attacks, stuff like this, and how to feed physically. And sigh and all this other stuff. I get it. Uh, uh, all putting the fucking cart before the horse, and no, and no one's even talking about how to build up the astral body first. I mean, how many of you yep. out there have had dreams? I know I've had them, where you look at your hand and you go lucid and it's all fucked up, or you try to talk and fight in a dream and you can't move your fucking arms because you're bilocating, you're actually having like sleep paralysis or a partial projection or you're trying to scream or something in a nightmare and your lips are fucking glued, that's because the astral hell, body needs fucking work, you know? Or hell, what, a, what about body? manifesting a weapon or being able to yeah. shift your consciousness enough to where you affect more than just whether you're running or standing? Yeah, that too. It's oh. You think it and it happens. Um, learn how to yeah. control your dreams. A good book uh, about that is Astral Dynamics by Robert Bruce. Um, he teaches all about um, astral projection, which is really bilocation, how it all works, how the yeah. dream state works, and everything like that. Yeah, uh, you got to build I've been, uh, properly before you been, go out on a hunt. You know. Yeah, I've been writing a book for about a year now about a systematic approach in my magical, my own personal magical system, and in my uh, sinister series on my uh, on my YouTube channel. I talk about the four shadows, and all of that is about perfecting and refining uh, the the uh, that uh, immortal, eternal body. It's 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 where your consciousness will go to exist beyond beyond the end of your flesh, beyond the life of your flesh, I should say, uh, because before you ever learn to feed or any of that other stuff. They should always teach the basic, the primer, of how to craft a body that you're being fed and that you're constantly using. Now, the body's form and shape and texture might change. I don't care if you imagine hooves, wings. I don't give a damn what, what you're applying to it. But if you do not stick to, stick to creating and crafting that body more solid day in and day out, you're you're gonna find that feeding just doesn't work for you. You're gonna find yourself at the mercy of cycles that are just cruel as fuck energetically to your mind, to your emotions, and to your physical health. Because the importance of all of this isn't being taught anymore. Everybody's got oh do this do that. Here's a spell. Here's a right. Uh, at high magic, the reason I fell in love with it is because the very first thing they teach you is creating the body of light. Now, it's not about the body of light or the body of darkness, you know, like I've said before in my videos. It has nothing to do with that. But the concept is solid. They teach you this in accordance with even your very first meditation. A body, a body, a body. doesn't matter what it's made out of. And my particular system, you know, all I do is I tap into the most rawest, purest form, the part that's being crafted while you're living in this life, and you're crafting it. You know, the Fravashi, the soul of shadows, is the most powerful thing. And yes, it's a procedure, and it's a long, drawn-out process. But at the end of it, you're talking about something that, be, with with uh, with a certain rituals, uh, with certain uh, meditations and practices, and if, if you hold to it and you do it, if you're proactive in your own fucking creation and your own fucking crafting of self, your own self-deification, when you when you die, 
your own blood, the blood as it cools and just slows in your body, will seal that body so perfectly, granting life unto it. You know, it's kind of like, you know, when they were talking about Jesus, you know, his sacrifice and all this, that, and the other. And I'm using this as an example. Do you know why that's held so powerful for over 2,000 fucking years, man? You know, whether or not he was voted in to believe or anything like this, but the myth itself persevered beyond everything. He gave his life, okay? And that's the key, is giving of one's life. On the path of apotheosis, it is a path of sacrifice. And fundamentally speaking, you have to look at your own physical life from this day on as being your responsibility for the crafting of your own immortality. And, you know, because who wants to go be recycled and karma and, you know, reincarnation and all this crap? And whether you believe in any of that or not, the thing is, is that there are so many scattered pieces out there. And nobody's putting them in an order for anybody to practice or to work with to become. And that's just that. So what I wanted to do now is I'm ready to dive headfirst into um, the old ones, the great old ones, the Shogos, the whole uh. cosmology. Start wherever you want, brother. Uh, okay, so this may sound a bit out there for anybody listening, and that's fine. Use your own discretion, use your own inner vision, use your own imagination, but just, you know, just just hear me out and keep it or toss it. It don't matter. But there you have, and, and they're divided. You have the great old ones. Now, the great old ones are like, holy crap, there's not a name for them. There was never a name for them. They were just great monstrous beings of the void who just crawled and crept. And just like in nature where you have the survival of the fittest, you know, the the predator feeding upon the prey, they were all the same way. Hell, they would eat one another if they were smaller, you know what I'm saying? But the thing is, is that after trillions of eons, you know, their numbers were whittled down. Now, I, you can't give a number or anything like that, you know, there's nothing... There's nothing plausible in giving a number because it would all be science fiction and just, you know, fanciful and just made up. But the solid concept is is that these great beings, you know, they were great powerful, powerful, powerful beings. And they just crept and crawled and rolled across the, uh, the depths of the void. And, you know, and they'd just crawl over something to eat it if it was smaller than them because there's no sight. There's no... Hearing, there's nothing like that. There wasn't even really a language and a sense of language. The only language they knew was hunger and sating that hunger. Uh, this is where, this is where, uh, it's manifested in this day and age, you know, beyond trillions of years. You know, this is called evolution. But, so these beings were doing this. But the thing is, is that after a while, they grew so great in size. That it was tiresome, just like it would be for us. We can only go so long before we got to have sleep or rest, you know, or food or anything. Well, they were much the same way. And so, and this isn't making them human. It's not like that. And this ain't me trying to, you know, to use the logical, rational part of my brain. This is just, you know, the way it was. So these things, they would enter in what was called the greats or the, uh, the sleep of ages. And it was a great sleep. Like, you can't really count, like, whether it was, whether it was a hundred years, a thousand years, whatever, because they were all different. And it depended on their energetic resonance and their, and the size of their mass, you know. Uh, and so anyway, so while they slept or they dreamt, because they were such great beings, they would, in, the, in their sleep, they were, they were excreting energy and power. And it was creating things while they slept. Well, these things that were born were some of the earliest races of old ones. Uh, the, the, uh, the children of the great old ones. And of course, you know, just like evolution with the human race, there was an evolution of them. Well, the old ones, the great old ones, when they'd wake up, you know, they'd find these things and they'd just, you know, roll over them and they'd eat them. And, you know, and, and, cause they were eating their own power, basically, is what was happening. 
and just recycling that energy and that power. So when they slept, they would give birth to all these things, and then they'd wake up hungry, and they just go, they just go down through there and just eat their own children. You know, this reminds you of Pluto. There's a reason why, uh, or not uh, Pluto. I'm trying to think of uh, Aditi that ate his own children thing. This is where that myth came from. You know, the reason why he did, you know, he eat his own children. Well, this is why, because, you know, powerful beings need great power. Well, what's more powerful than something that comes from that power? But eventually what happened was that why they were doing this, there were certain of the old ones that actually survived. And because it was an evolutionary thing, just like we genetically uh, evolved and our minds, our psyches themselves developed more and more over time from, from caveman to modern day, you know, so did their consciousness expand, you know, through all the, through all the births and being devoured, births being devoured. You know, energy has a memory. And these things that were being born were, you know, were like, well, we're, hey, we are food, you know. And so some of them tried to create defenses, you know, like, you know, well, if we can run if we can hide. They were making side pockets in dimensions, you know, counter dimensions within the void. But the void being the way it was, now this is before the veil known as the abyss, before it ever came to be. The abyss of the veil was actually created by some of the most ancient of old ones who were actually, you know, knowledgeable and powerful enough to create it. So it would be a barrier to keep the great old ones out. And so what happened was that through evolution, they started crafting something known as the Shagoth. The Shagoth started off as like what we call cows or sheep or goats, chickens, you know, the things that we, you know, the the meat that we raise upon the earth to be, you know, to feed us. Well, the old ones were raising the Shagoths to feed these, you know. And anybody who's worked with Shagoths, that, I mean, that's honestly worked with Shagoths, not ones who are sitting there listening to me going, dude, Shagoths are real, they're fucking made up, all whatever. Uh, you, you've never messed with them, or you know a big difference that that's not true at all. Uh, but anyway, so the Shagoths were literally crafted and made to be cattle, livestock, to feed these great old ones so that they would quit, you know, eating, you know, eating their own children. Their own children came together and came up with this great idea of, hey, let's make something they can eat. Well, the Shagoth was the very first thing that was crafted like that, and it hailed. Like, holy crap, these things will wake up and eat it, and they were easily killed. Well, meanwhile, the old ones were sitting back going, holy shit, that worked. But even then, it became a danger to them. They knew that that wouldn't last forever because, like I said, the evolution of the psyche, of the mind, and energy is memory. These things will get just as smart as the children were. If you can think of something along that scale, the most primal of predators of being intelligent, they were intelligent, but in the sense of an animalistic sense, not necessarily you know, like we think, you know, because the great old ones, they were born and created out of desperation. Their intelligence was born out of survival. So if not for these great old ones eating their own children, uh, self-preservation would have never been created. It would have never developed. So a lot of the, uh, a lot of the mental acuities that we as humans can say that we have now, we can literally thank the great old ones for having created and instilled because if it hadn't been for them and the boy doing what they did, it would have never evolved. It evolved through their children, through their offspring, through the different races. And so, and so eventually after a while, you know, they started realizing that, you know, hey, we've got to do something different. And so their first concept was to, you know, we've got to build a wall which I know sounds a lot like something else that I want to talk about. But literally, they're like, you know, we got to put up a fence or something, to, some kind of barrier to keep these, you know, to keep them back so that they don't devour us. Well, the thing is, is that that's when the, uh, that's when the abyss was created, was to, add, you know, was, that was their so-called pocket dimension. It's where, it's where the races of the old ones actually flourished. They actually, it was, it was like the realm. It's why uh, in the clip off, it's known as the realm of shells. 
because holy crap, that's where these cast off thoughts and remnants, that's where these old ones could actually exist, you know. But even after a while, they threaten to, you know, the great old ones threaten to break through that. So the next thing you know, they're sitting there like, holy crap, we got to come up with something. Well, they realized that light, light literally burnt or stunned, more like stunned, because I can imagine the first time one of them created a pale luminescent light, and it, and it even paused it for three seconds, you know, being a collective, uh, collective mind, they were like, holy crap, they don't like light, you know, so this became evolved. And that's where the concept of, like, the stars and stuff like that, and the stars are just suns, and they're just bodies of light is all they are. And they acted as a barrier, and they keep the great old ones out. And it's, you know, and the Necronomicon, you know, talks about a time when they were and shall come again and all this other stuff, you know. And now, mind you, all this is previous to the ancient ones like Apsu, Tiamat, and stuff like that, because they are descendants of the old ones, if that makes any sense. And I honestly believe Pazuzu to actually be one of the very first of the offspring of the old ones. Because I find that, that timeline-wise, he is just as ancient and just as powerful as Tiamatu or Tiamat or Apsu or any of them. Because outside of Apsu and Tiamat, on this side of the void, uh, he was the only one that was not crafted or created by either of them. And there are many entities, many spirits, that weren't created by the ancient ones, by Tiamat up to so forth and so on. There were a wide range of races that came from the old ones, and they're the ones that that in modern day occultism and mythology, we look back and we hear the story about, oh, the creation was on the back of a turtle, you know, uh, this, that, and the other, you know, the slaying of Tiamat and the blood of Kingu, or, you know, whatever mythology you're using. Uh, they're all true because every single one of them tell an aspect or a story of one of the races uh, of the spawn of the old ones. Like I said, it's all about putting the pieces together. I hope I didn't go too far out on a limb with that one. Oh, no, that's that's a great introduction. That was that's very fucking badass. So what you're basically what I got from this is that there's these great terrible monsters that were just there forever, and their children, the old ones, and even their children. The Shogos and even their children, children's children, a couple generations down, the ancients, we, we see a common theme, basically, of monsters running away from the bigger monsters fleeing from getting devoured. So that eventually led to the creation of the universe. And I, so these suns are almost like flashlights in the eyes of uh, these old ones to kind of not necessarily blind them, but to keep them away. Uh, they don't really like the sun. They don't like the light. Well, what it is, well, what it is, and you got to look at this in a very simple, basic term. So in the void, there's nothing. There's not. Yeah. Okay. Think of it as the, an the antithesis of creation. It's the opposite. It's pure, raw, raw, uh, unused okay. potential that that energy or power could be placed into chaos. anything. Yeah. The, the thing is, is that these beings that are there, a lot of the things that exist on this side of the veil, they don't, they, they, it's energetically, it's, it's order. And because they're not created or crafted of order, they can't exist together. And see, and that's the, that's the true separator. See, as long as there's existence, those things have to stay on that side. Uh, that's why, like in certain myths, when I talk about, you know, uh, the end of the world or, you know, whether it's, uh, whether everything is drawn back into that main black hole that all existence, all the cosmos came from, yeah. you know, whether it's that or whether it's great and mighty as thought, you know, waking up from his dream and everything ceases to be, uh, whether it's the monks of Tibet, you know, 
uh, quit, uh, quit chanting the, uh, I can't remember what it is. It's a, it's a mantra that as long as it's, uh, as long as it's spoken or said, the world will continue to exist. Creation will. Oh, after, but as soon as it ceases, yeah. After this conversation, I want you to send me. Uh, I want you to send me a, a link about that mantra. I've definitely, I've been interested in the Tibetan <sighs> Buddhist shit. Brother, I don't have any links for that, right. man. This shit I've read a long time ago. All right, yeah, no worries. Um, if you don't mind, um, I would like to um, just. I'd like to pick at this um, uh, with it's with psychology for a bit. What you see in there lines up with what Michael Tassarian said that uh, that the womb or the black hole of of non-existence, the womb is is constantly yawning. It's constantly beckoning. It's like a gravity, yeah. and everything, all life, even in our mundane lives, is evolving getting as far away from that black hole as possible. Yeah. So when you grow up... Yeah, because it's like a gaping maw. It is yeah. a gaping maw. And when you grow up and when you make, when you create yourself and when you create your life and when you get your independence and your job and your car and live on your own and everything like that, when you've accomplished something with your life, then you've become heroic. You've entered into the solar realm. Which takes a lot of work. It, it's it's very exceedingly difficult. It takes a lot of work for it, but it comes with great reward. reward. I could not help um, but think of that same parallel when you were describing the origins of the great, from the great old ones to almost the present. That we have a, a succession of evolution from the womb to being yeah, to consciousness and it's entering and it's shown the realm, the in realm everyday life. Yeah, so even though these beings are completely non-human, they're completely alien archetypes and completely cosmic horror, there is still that parallel up the fractal there from the womb into creation, into existence, and into the solar realm. Everything progresses further into more complexity and sovereignty. You want to hear something really crazy? Yes. Uh, psychologically speaking, do you know where we get our our primal our primal emotions from? So, if you look at the great old ones as actions, and you think of our primal reactions or our primal emotions as reactions, you've got this. You remember before I was telling you about the great old ones and about the collective consciousness and how it worked. How you know after evolution of how many children? that they had created and devoured, created and devoured, and how that memory still remained and just evolved like the human race evolves. See, it's symbolic of evolution itself. Evolution never ceased. Evolution will never cease. You know, and that's the thing about it, you know, when, you, when you're dealing with uh, people who are, who are into complete nihilism where, you know, there's got to be an ending, like let's say the religious, for example, you know, they're going to be... <laughs> They're going to be sadly blown out of the fucking water when they realize this shit show ain't ready to stop any time. So, you know, uh, because it's interesting that, like, you know, where, where fear comes from, where dread comes from, these, pr these raw primal emotions and feelings that we have, dude, they're not natural. You can take a, you can take a one month old and scare them from a sound. Now, you can sit there and try to justify and explain that all you fucking want. But when a child jerks and just pure fear out of nowhere and there's nothing you've done to them at all, there's no sound, no nothing like that, you know, that's that pro that's that raw primal uh, instinct that's born within us. Dude, that was, gen that was passed down, down the line through many, many, many lines. And that is still instilled within us. You know, take for example, why does anybody care whether or not they're a predator or whether they're prey? Well, because nobody wants to be ate or destroyed or, you know, taken. So, of course, you know, why not walk the path of a predator? But the thing about it is, is that predatorial drive isn't just necessarily about, because you, ha you have to eat to survive. You have to consume to continue. That's true in spirit as well as it is flesh in the physical realm. The thing is, is that that fear that is, that 
that drives us to that point. Some of us aren't necessarily out there to we're the biggest, baddest dogs on the yard type thing. We do it more out of self-preservation. Well, why would you do it out of self-preservation? But that it was taught. It was spiritually taught to us. It is a soul lineage. Because the soul, the practical part of ourselves, dude, that is what, that is what those great old ones were eating were souls that they had created and crafted. And they had slowly, they had slowly gained such an intelligence of their own that they, that they shared what is known as ancestral memory. You know, the ones that came before them. And like I said, as they grew smarter, it's no different than us generationally speaking here as human beings upon the face of planet Earth. You know, whether we've been here for a million years, whether we've been here for 30,000 years, doesn't really matter. We got proof that we've been around a lot longer than that. But the, the point of the whole thing is, is that evolution never ceased. And there are different parts of us that are always evolving. Every single aspect of us is evolving. And I'm not just talking about the cells aging within our bodies. No, I'm talking about bone structure, uh, different uh, paths, neural pathways in our brain, uh, the awakening of different parts of our brain, of our psyche itself, uh, you know, so forth and so on. And this, this evolutionary aspect of the soul I haven't been crafted and the soul, they say, the, 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 the mind is the seed of the soul. So the psyche is what feeds the soul. It's not necessarily that the, that the gray mass inside your skull is literally your soul. No. But the consciousness, the awareness, the energetic, the energetics of the, of the synapses occurring in the brain feeds it and fuels that soul, making it stronger. This is why rituals that call upon ancient deities are so powerful and so life altering and changing. This is why doing rites of prosperity, of abundance, of gnosis, of attaining, of ascending, and so forth and so on. This is why they're so powerful. It's because they allow us to make to make leaps and giant bounds in evolution. They allow us to to not, progress. Not even causal, from, uh, not limited to causal leaps. You're making a causal leaps back in time, back in exactly, timelines and different universes. Exactly. You are fucking exactly. Affirming your fucking lineage, you are fucking affirming your soul line, you are fucking affirming how old you are, how eternal you are, how continuous you are, and how your your own divinity, just by... Yeah, and this ain't mental masturbation. Yep. <laughs> it's a beautiful part about it. Fucking beautiful. So, uh, with all that said, where does this leave now, what was, who, who created Earth, who created life in the stars, and for what purpose? Well, I'm just going to be honest with you. I don't know, and I don't give a fuck. <laughs> I'm not being an asshole or a dick. I'm just saying, I don't know, and I don't give a fuck. I just know that it was crafted, it was made, this is where we are, and it's a plane or a realm in which we can establish our personal dominance and where we can craft our own uh, spiritual kingdom, if you will, and where we, where we have the opportunity to craft through through both mental, spiritual, emotional, and physically build our uh, our eternal selves, or we can craft that Fravashi into a being that is like and done to the great old ones, you know. This is just the, this is just the, uh, uh, this is just the, uh, the crafting field, man. This is where, this is the garden, dude. This is where we build. This is where we grow. You know, when I talk about gardens, whether you're talking about the Garden of Eden or you're talking about the Land of Nod, uh, that's in Eden, what, it, it doesn't matter what. And if you let go of the religious connotation and you just look at it, we live in a gigantic fucking garden. On this side of the veil, we live in a gigantic fucking garden where we can craft ourselves, our environment, where we can build our own spiritual kingdoms, where we can start to, to build or to destroy or destroy so that we can build. Dude, this, this is the ultimate place of creation or plane of creation. It wasn't just created 
It is a place where creation continues. So see, it's not like, oh, this is fixed, and this is the way it's going to be. Once again, everything is constantly evolving. The earth underneath our feet is constantly evolving. You know, as long as we don't destroy it, you know, we'll be doing good. And, you know, but that's the, but there are aspects of ourself that we have to defeat. We have to defeat that self nihilistic tendency of, you know, of abusing our, of abusing ourselves or abusing, well, abusing others comes from the abuse that we do ourselves or that others have done upon us. And so we're overcoming these things through, through infernal rights, through working with the demons and the infernal kingdom and, you know, even working with, uh, celestial or angelic beings because there is no division. If you want to look at it, uh, we were talking about this. So I got it, I got it pretty much divided into two major areas. And in my system, they represent, they're represented by two serpents. So you've got the celestial, which is a mixture of air and fire. And there are the higher realms. There, they are visualized or seen as the white serpent. You have the cathonic, which is earth and water, and it is visualized and seen as a black serpent. And the thing about this is that these two complementary halves, one represents the less dense, one represents the denser. But the thing is, is that both halves are a singular piece. But we, as the magician quoting the tarot card here on this one have to unite these two forces, you know, because one is the Magus, Twain is his, Twain are his forces. You know, what that basically saying is that you have to take the two halves and make them one. Well, if you have these two pieces and you have yourself, then there's three, and that's perfect because that's the trinity. And that's the that's the trinity of creation when you involve yourself. If you were to look at it like, oh, well, these are powers outside of myself, then you've not stepped up to play. You know, you're not really serious about wanting to craft yourself or craft your world. You know, you're waiting on some some spooky fictional pie in the sky godhead to, to fucking do it for you when from everything I've seen out there, it's either it's either you take control or something else will. So if you're not willing to do the first and foremost blasphemous act and that's to take your godhead upon yourself, uh, well, then, you know, somebody else is going to take all your power, all your divinity. They're going to take everything about you, even your physical strength, and they're going to use it for whatever the fuck they want. Think about this life. If you're not proactive in your own fucking physical life and well-being, nobody else is. And whatever little bit you do have to, to offer, somebody out there is willing to take every bit of it. You know, whether it's your strength, your money, whatever. Yeah, like and that's it. something you do not, that is something you don't get back. You yeah, know, the externalization you've, you've got to take that stance. The externalization of the hierarchy is pure bullshit. Um, we already have that divinity uh, within ourselves. We have that void of the self within the self. We have the keys. We are fucking locks and keys in the fucking gates. Uh, the essence of shit, but yeah, definitely don't slow down, don't sit and wait, because um, there's two kinds of people in this world. There are uh, people that, there are individuals who make life happen, and then there are fucking spectators on the sidelines that wait for life to happen to them, and you don't want to be one of those sitting on the side bleachers waiting for life to happen to you, because, well, you'll just be a victim You'll be a reactionary, a victim of everything else around you. I spent the first eight years of my magical life learning as much as I possibly could from books and from meditation and working with spirits. And I lived pillar to post. Nothing was steady. Nothing was solid underneath my feet. You know, job to job, so forth and so on. And one day it occurred to me that if I, if I myself do not go out there and create that balance, I'll never have it. You know, you got to have solidity. You know what I'm saying? You've, you've got to have a place to lay your head. You know, you've got to have food, uh, so forth and so on. I mean, some people are, are cool, 
uh, riding the riding the waves of of the feel good energy of spirit, and just you know, oh, the universe will provide, blah blah blah, and it'll you know all this other shit. Well, that's great and fucking dandy. Back when I was nineteen, that was great. That was great. That was awesome. I did that for about oh, I don't know, two and a half years, until I realized that that's not the way to yeah. to. To, to anything other than becoming somebody's slave it's or falling to the illusion because they, it's, it's whether you look at it as deities influencing you or you look at it as universal consciousness influencing you, the concept works that if you yourself do not stop and take control and guide and craft your own fucking life, You'll never, you'll, you'll never be in a place like I've seen so many people that are like, they can't do this and they can't do that because they're waiting on this event or they're waiting for this to change. And they're like, dude, if you don't, if you don't take a hold of it right now, the perfect moment will never be there. You've got to create the perfect moment or as perfect as you can. Speak that language. And second, people that are like that, the reactionaries that sit on the fucking bleachers waiting for life to happen they never left the void that as far as I'm concerned they never left the womb there it's it's an excuse to regress back to the autistic infantile level not to bash autistic people i'm not using that word in the psych in the psychiatry uh, medical condition context i'm using it in the biological um infantile context of the word because it does mean it does mean to be like an so these people are regressive. They they don't they don't have the willpower to thrust themselves into the heroic solar world. So they are staying in the feminine lunar world, um, the passive world, while everything else just continues to fucking bombard them and go yeah. and continue on all around them. And see, I'm by no means fucking perfect. I have lazy days that turn into lazy into a lazy week. I really do. But over the last last five years or so, I've learned to to balance out everything. You know, you have a physical life you must maintain. You have if you have a someone in your life that you're in a relationship with, you've got to have that. You know, whether it's you know cousins, friends, sisters, whether you have a whether you have a mate, you know, relationships in general, okay? Then you have the magical self that you must feed and maintain. Uh, you know, you've got to take time for studying and meditation and all this other stuff. But then you absolutely need some down-to-earth time where I don't care if it's sitting there watching cartoons. I don't care okay. if it's going out flying a kite with your kids. I don't give a fuck what it is. Okay. But you've right. got to have yes. some mundane time because you've got to ground that shit out. Oh, yeah. You know, not, take it from I'm somebody. Bashing, I'm not bashing. Somebody that for. At all. You absolutely yeah. do have to have that time for yourself. I, there, I spent uh, 19 you. years, day in, day out, from the time I got up to the time I went down. Nothing but magic. I mean, magical conversation, magical studies, magical practices. Hell, I was doing this shit in my fucking sleep with, like, dreamscaping, you know, so forth and so on. Uh, and, you know, and I always found myself that I was, that doing that, I was imbalanced as fuck. And I know that imbalance is a form of balance itself, you know, if you follow a, 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 Celtic, a Celtic concept there of, you know, imbalanced is balanced. Uh, but the concept is that, you know, that's not the kind of imbalance they're talking about. The kind of imbalance they're talking about is where you don't have a fixed uh, belief system or where you allow it to shift or change as you grow, as you become. That's what they mean by imbalance. These people out there that are sitting there like, well, the way I practice imbalance is that, you know, uh, I do whatever I want to whenever I want to, you know, and I don't believe in anything and all this, that, and the other. That's not imbalance. That's ignorant. Yeah. That's ignorant, you know. And I'm not trying to step on toes. I'm just saying that's not what they're referring to when they say imbalance. What they're talking about is that you have to maintain a sense of knowing who and what you are and what you're about. But you're not supposed to hold such a strict hold 
on your belief systems and your practices to where it can manifest physically as judgmentalism towards others who do not believe or think like you do, who do not agree with you, you know, so forth and so on. You have to allow things to flow. You just do. That's just how it works. That's imbalance. That's the kind of spiritual imbalance I'm talking about. Okay? There is no right. There is no left. You know, there's no right and wrong, good and bad, you know, up and down, inside and out, or whatever, whatever concept that you, that you have to employ uh, mentally to be able to maintain that harmony, you know. And that's, that's how you do that. But I spent like 19, 20 years doing that shit day in and day out until I realized that, you know, it started, uh, the manifestation of it was more like, you know, I couldn't have like a regular conversation with somebody, you know, like I couldn't sit there and just shoot the shit with somebody, you know, joking and stuff, you know, they'd be like, dude, you're way too serious, you know, so forth and so on. And, you know, and, and then it was like, you know, having to pull a stick out of my own ass and being like, you know, it's okay to laugh, it's okay to joke. You're not going to lose your spiritual connection. You're not going to lose the uh, the strength of self that you've built up inside yourself. You're actually exploring a deeper aspect of yourself. You're seeing how, how all that study and all that practice, how strong is it? Will it last at the end of the day if you don't do a ritual, if you don't do a meditation? Now, I'm not... I'm not saying this to the people who are like, oh, okay, so as a beginner, it's okay for me to just, you know, to do it whenever I feel like it. Dude, I run across way too many people that don't understand you got to do the damn work. That's not what I'm talking about, but I'm saying that when you're doing your practice or you're doing your workings, don't forget to take time to sit down and, you know, Ruin some brain cells on something monotonous and stupid that's not serious, you know, whether it's watching cartoons, whether it's watching a movie, whether, you know, it's going out and having a drink with your friends, whether, you know, whatever the fuck, something mundane. You do have to grab doesn't it fucking matter. Or you'll get overload. You know, too much yeah. Gnosis but it's also a test. Dig yeah. this. When you harmonize your life, it is also a test. For And, and it's not a test like the universe is testing you. But it is like a test of sorts where you realize, oh, holy crap, I can still enter into a trance state without having to, you know, stay in a magical mindset 24-7, 364 days a year. You know what I'm saying? You learn that, that you've built up such a strength of confidence in yourself that you're not going to lose those abilities. Yes, you do have to use them. You can get rusty at them, you know, so forth and so on. Muscles must be worked. I mean, they just have to. But you don't have to go go at it like, you know, it's the end all be all and the world's gonna end if you haven't, you know, done your your rest right, you know <laughs> for you know, for a year's time, which rest for a year sucks. Anybody who's ever followed high magic and done the great workings of the Golden Dawn and has literally done the rest for a year knows exactly what I'm talking about. It is crazy as hell. To wake up and remember five times a day to do this prayer. That is so crazy. But it teaches you discipline, though. It really does. You just find new ways to discipline yourself. When you see that you've gone two or three days and and you haven't done anything meditation-wise or you haven't done anything to, like, feed your, feed your soul, for lack of better words, dude, take time to go do it so you know set down the remote go do it you know uh tell your buddies you'll have to catch them next weekend or something you know at the bar or whatever the fuck yeah, you know it's completely okay to prioritize and the most successful yeah and it's a, and it's okay to laugh and it's okay to joke and it's okay to, to you know not take everything so damn seriously and, and, and i want to make this important it's okay to say no your your priorities you are not Oh, you do not owe the collective shit, okay? Outsiders, nope. Uh, their family members are not putting them down, anything like that, okay? It's important. You have to have a time slot that's just for you. If you have to say no to uh, going out to the bar, if you have to say no to going to this wedding or this event or that event, that's completely okay. And if and if they don't, and if that's gonna like burn a bridge or end a relationship, 
over that, then then fuck them because they weren't your friends. They're 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 dependents, Co codependency, yeah. narcissism. And let me go one step further and say, there's no deity one that's gonna fucking judge you over that. You know. When you die or when you're alive, for having lived your fucking life, if you weren't meant to experience the physical living life in this form, you would not have been. Born. I agree. And so many people forget that. But also there's a lot of people that that's all they do is live this life and they don't even have five minutes for meditation. But they want somebody to teach them magic. Like, that's crazy as hell. If you ain't got the kind of discipline it takes to set aside time and organize your shit. Don't even bother with it. Yeah, it's just a fad. Just go about your business. Episodics. So why why do the gods and these uh, these different celestial beings, different races, the old ones in the infernal, why why do they take interest in man? They have the void. What do they have to gain from us? Because you know about that evolution and growth that I was talking about earlier. As they as they build us up, they are working their muscles. They are building themselves up. As you rise, I rise. As you fall, I fall. That's the first thing my daemon told me when I uh, yeah. first uh, got the knowledge and conversation of, at the time I was known as a holy guardian angel. Later on in the refinement of it, it became it becomes the daemon, uh, which I'm not going to go into all that. I've done a video on that before, but the, the thing is, is that as they build us up, they build themselves up. You know what I'm saying? So, no, there's no such thing. As a lax and silent universe, the only yeah. lax and silence there is is in the void where, you know, all is and is not, you know. Uh, but on this side of the veil and, and what is known as uh, the creation or that which is, uh, because the void can be seen as that which is not. And it's not like a great dualism, so I don't want somebody going there on their head thinking, oh, so it's the opposite of this. No, no, no. No, it's completely different. It's not even a duality thing. It's a, mix, uh, it's a mixed but the, bag, everything and nothing at the same time. Yeah, it's its own right. bag of what the fuck. I think Thunder, but, uh, Wizard, Thunder Wizard described the void as like if you were in the center of our supermassive black hole, the center of our galaxy, it would be like the energy of millions of SAR bombs, hydrogen bombs going off at once. The pressure is absolutely fucking immense. It's, the millions of nuclear bombs going off at once every fucking millisecond. Um, Ganunga Gap in, in Norse really means yawning abyss. It sounds like because it's literally roaring. That's it's because super, the uh, super, it's super the void it's very to myself, place. the void to me uh, very much reminds me of a uh, uh, but for lack of better words, uh, the consciousness of the most ancient of days. Um, holy crap, I don't even know how to explain it. If you were to think of one thing that made everything, um, and it was combined in a totality, it would not exist in a form. It would be formless, yet its consciousness would be. And the void reminds me of its consciousness. As it dreams, it is dreaming all things, but the void is the place from which it creates. It is its actual consciousness itself. And, you know, that, uh, it goes back to the concept of as a thought, because I, I have oddly enough, strangely thought that the concept of how you can even comprehend as a thought at all is not to imagine him as a being. But as a consciousness, because when even with the great old ones and these really, really fucking nameless, formless, faceless things that you couldn't describe, that there's no way to. That's because they do not exist in a form of any of any consistency that we would see. Everything that we see on everything that we see or we can imagine is is a weak image that has been expressed from the void. Because void has no expression. 
its expression is given beyond the abyss, which is the veil that separates the void and all of creation and reality. It's like, uh, you know how they say the eyes, everything is upside down? Yeah. But between the mind and the eyes, it uprights it so that we think we see brain. things straight up, or you know, right side up or whatever. The brain, the brain well, I imagine that that's how it works with the void. That's how void side works. I like that. Interesting. And, and what you're getting into, it's like um, you know, we, we can talk about formlessness all day, but these some of these things go beyond formlessness. These are conceptional list that you can't even conceive of them they go beyond what that's that, and that's where they exist brother that's where they exist and if you're not able to comprehend on that level these things are way over your head and also yeah. I want to put this out there there's a reason they call these things alien because they are unfriendly to the human condition understand what I said okay. unfriendly to the human condition they are bound and conceived of things, and they abide within a, a set of structure that is completely alien to the way we see or view and can understand or comprehend a thing. Completely alien to it. And if you could, it would literally crack your mind, not, not like in a physical sense, like, you know, a hammer upside the head would crack your skull, not that, but the essence that holds your mind together that allows it to stay rational it would quickly become irrational if you were to, like, delve into its consciousness deep enough. And that's why they call him the uh, the mad god, because to tap into that consciousness could cause an, ins an insanity of sort. However, those of us who, who, who dwell within that realm, who play around in it, and I say play lightly, but those of us who dwell there or craft from there or create from there or interact... You know, it's why a lot of the times it seems like we're really fucking out there somewhere, because that's the side effect of doing that kind of stuff, of working within those, within those spheres, uh, within the consciousness itself. It get expanded. It's a, it's a brain blast or a mind explosion. You can't help but get elevated there. And what's really fucking crazy is that. um you know, we could actually, the, the, the adepts who are great at this work, they might actually get to that level someday. I mean, some aeon, some eternity um, here or now or later down the line. They can become an Azatoth or, become, or even exceed him. Yeah, and it's like, uh, for example, should never end. I think of the void as being the the complete and total consciousness of Azathoth. That is why we can't comprehend or understand. That's why they say, you know, that you can't summon them or, you know, call them or any of this other stuff, because there's no way. There, there's absolutely no way to actually do that. You, you can play around in the mind of that thing all day long. Yeah. You know, but that's, that's about the best you're going to do. Because and there, so you know, have to, there's no easy way around that. He'd have to make himself smaller. He'd have to make the the that which has no measure would have to make itself limited in the very act would just rip the whole multiverse apart. It would just rip yeah. It see, apart. and and there's nothing simple about making something so so uh, luminous liminal. You can't make it liminal. Exactly. That's the only way I know how to put that. You cannot, you cannot make that liminal. It didn't, uh, I think it's a lot like the way Love, H.P. Lovecraft put it. Um, a lot of these things, they're just so elevated. They're completely indifferent and uncaring and unknowing and maybe even ignorant of the human condition. Because well, they're, they're, not, un the they're not unfriendly or uncaring. That's not what it is. Well, there, is no, there is no sense of humanity in them because they're not human. Yeah. And that's what I mean by they're unfriendly to the human condition. Because they're not human, because they have no inkling or idea of what it is to be human, yeah, I, anything I that you could get from them, holy crap. Like, uh, there are a lot of really, really, really old uh, entities, deities, consciousness, whatever you want to call them, uh, that when you're interacting with them and you're trying to get them to, to teach you something or share something with you or show you something, a lot of the times, a lot of what they, a lot of what they would show you, you're sitting there going, Dude, I can't do that. That's not, 
Like, I'd go to jail in a heartbeat trying to, you know, this ain't that since years ago where, you know, she'd go hide in the mountain doing this shit, you know. You can't quite do that. And and they're stunned at that because, you know, they don't understand uh, what this human thing is. They don't, yeah. they don't understand laws, rules, uh, shit like to, that. I wanted to finish the H.P. Lovecraft quote. A lot of them are um, are just indifferent to the human condition. Some are openly malevolent, and even fewer are actually um, actually benevolent. Benevolent. <laughs> they, uh, yeah, actually there's a, benevolent that actually you have to take effort. their essence and force, and you have to craft it by your by your desire, your design. I can see down the line that actually the benevolent ones, if there were any, they'd be a lot smaller. They're closer to some of the ra- some of the stellar races and some of the gods that have yeah. interfaced with this planet. Because, like I said, like you even said earlier, that when they work with us and we work with them, they build each other up. It's an actual symbiosis, you know, like. Um, well, at, at, at best, at best, I'm, I'm just going to say this. I'm going to be honest about it. At best, mm-hmm. it's symbiotic. Yeah. At worst, at worst, it's whose will is greater. I'm just, dude, I'm just going to put that out there because anybody that uh, works this type of uh, magic or, or, or arcane force knows that you're playing with something beyond the spectrum of normal magics. And even even rights are incomplete, uh, so forth and so on. You literally have to energetically, consciously know how to connect with certain of their essences. And then it's even harder to channel and direct. And it takes a lot of patience and a lot of discipline just to be able to craft their essence into an object or to channel it into yourself so that you can ascertain uh True gnosis. It's not impossible, but it's one of those things where you you can't smoke yourself stupid every day. I don't give a fuck what anybody says. I don't care if it's meth or it's weed. I don't give a damn what you're smoking. You cannot. You cannot. In in that in that uh, scope, do you know with that kind of practice, think that you're going to connect and work with something like this? Because it absolutely requires pure discipline. And you have to have complete control and dominance over your, over the faculties of your own mind. This is where people break. This is where people go insane. This is where they develop psychosis. And, oh, even some of the darker arts that I've read where they're talking about certain marks and certain signs, certain seasons and so forth and so on during certain astrological times uh, with certain comets in the sky, so forth and so on. Those are like tumblers and a lock for the timing. But even some of theirs is unnecessary, but it's required. And I'm quite thankful that there aren't enough practitioners knowledgeable of that type of thing, or there would be uh, there would be some pretty nasty crimes committed upon the earth, and not because it's required, but because it takes a certain force to compel or to attract those types of energies. Because I want you to think of something: Why in the world would the myth of the devil want your soul? or any devil one your soul, where do you think that concept come from? That's because at a certain point, souls are pure, untapped power and potential. And if somebody's not going to use theirs, there's somebody down the road that will. And, you know, and I'm, I'm quite blessed to know the things I do and have the skill and ability to do. It's but there are some things I just won't fucking do under any circumstance. But I can imagine it to people out there that if they did, that they would. Mm-hmm. And that's the kind of stuff that not necessarily scares me, but it bothers me because I'm like, you know, let's let's put morals aside for a second. Imagine the type of mentality it would take for somebody that could do that. And then second off, 
Could you honestly call them a brother or a sister? Could you honestly trust them? No, you fucking couldn't. And see, and that's why the ancient practitioners of this type of shit, the true black brotherhood, the true black adepts, this is why they were shunned. This is where the hunting down of witches and all this other stuff truly came from thousands of years ago. Because when it's known that somebody has an ability or a skill that can do shit like that and actually make shit happen, and I'm not talking about bring the rain or make the crops grow. or No, no, no. I'm talking about truly powerful shit like who can make it go dark, pitch dark in the middle of the fucking day. Well, they have a purpose behind why they would do that because they would need darkness at a certain time of day to be able to draw down an, uh, an entity or a being so that they could enslave it or so that they could feed from it. And both are viable, but what they're doing is something that's against the, uh, not necessarily a moral law, but like a spiritual law of sorts. And there's nothing that's, you know, and, and if you look at laws and shit like that, laws are meant to be bent, not broken. And the reason why is because the universe has a nasty, nasty habit of balancing out whatever you do. I don't give a damn if you're capable of doing some of this shit. Somewhere down the road, the universe has to balance that shit out because the universe is all about harmony. And when you and when you interject and you take away something, something has to fill its place, good or bad, whether it's now or whether it's a thousand years down the road. An event or something will happen that will completely allow harmony to reign again. You see, this is why not just anybody is able to gain this kind of knowledge, because it's not about whether you could or you couldn't. It's about whether you would or wouldn't. Because watch the people who, who have true power, who have true ability. They're never the ones that would go out there and do it just because they fucking could. They would only use it if they had to, if it was necessary. This is just something, whether you agree or disagree with me, do some research, study, look into it. See if not the most, the most capable of people weren't the ones that were showing off and showboating it. Hey, look what I can do. They were always the motherfuckers that could do it, made no show about it. But at the same time, when they did it, it was because it was necessary, not because they just, you know, wanted to get their rocks off. I agree with you there. You raised an Sorry, because point earlier I'm not big into morals, but I am big into, you know, speaking the truth of a thing. Because I don't give a damn what anybody does, right or wrong, good or bad, whatever. Don't fuck with me, and I'm not going to fuck with you. I hate the word moral. I fucking hate it. I fucking hate it. Yeah, because, dude, it's just another form of control. Well, what they did, they fucking took they took natural law, and they turned they, the, 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 the churches, the religious, they've made morality into like, oh, what you do in the bedroom, what you do with your own body, and they took everything that isn't an issue and made it into a fucking issue. So, so yep. what, what really it is, is the real thing is, are you being a dick about it or not? That's the only thing that really matters. Well, see, no matter how you approach that, someone's going to say you're being moral or that you're being judgmental and all this other crap. Here's the thing about it. The universe doesn't care whether you did it for a good reason or a bad reason. There's just no such thing. Everything is about as neutral as all get out. Mankind and our self-righteous superiority created the laws and the rules by which the world is governed. Whether it's socially acceptable or not socially acceptable, we crafted and created fucking morals. The these deities and beings did not. <clears throat> now we did it for self-preservation and to protect the tribe and our people and so forth and so on. But there was a time in history, uh, like during the time of the uh, of the Edomites, when this was not a thing, you know, pre-flood and all this other stuff. Because there was a time when, when lawlessness and ruthlessness and all this, all this such shit, when it, when it ran rampant. There was nothing wrong with that being there at that time, but, but notice that, you know, nature created something that just damn near wiped these people out completely. You know, you know, the great flood, you know, whether, whether you believe the biblical version, the one from Mesopotamia, you know, whatever. But the thing is, the point is, is that there was a time in our history 
Well, we were ruthless. We were lawless. We lived by by the laws of blood and iron. I mean, when we just, you know, when that's what it was, when the when the uh, bloodline of Cain was upon this earth and was strong within its people, when the when the adjunct of blood magics and all this other stuff, when it was lived, when it wasn't just preached and talked about, but it was an everyday expression of life, you know, whether it's through the recourse of sexual energy, through through blood sacrifice, whether willing or unwilling. Uh, you know, so forth and so on. There was no, everybody romanticizes it, but it wasn't no, you know, well, as long as you were part of a group, you were seen as a great brotherhood and blah, blah, blah. No, man, no. No, these people kept everybody at bay through bluffing and fear. You know, it, it wasn't like that. And, you know, in nature itself, because of everything that that magic and that power was unlocking, and I'm not talking about no angels that were defiled and mated with man and woman and all this other crap and made races of beings and all this. Dude, whether there's proof or not, that doesn't matter. What does matter is that the concept was like this right here. There was a time when something was being done, and it must have been causing one hell of an imbalance because the earth wanted to clean off of it, or, you know, most of it. We still have traces and details of it. Plus, there are mystics that are able to, you know, discern, you know, ancient knowledge of this and bring it back to the forefront of, of modern day consciousness, you know. Um, but with this, I mean, this is where the concept of like, uh, what was it, uh, the city of the sun beneath the seas with Lemuria and, uh, uh, what was the name of that city, dude? Atlantis. Yeah, Atlantis, Atlantis you know, Atlantis stuff was, like this. Atlantis wasn't yeah. a city, it was a realm, it was an entire... Well, the thing is, is whether it was or wasn't, uh, whether the uh, the kingdom of Adom with the Edomites and with the branches of the tribes and stuff like this, the warlords and all this other stuff, you know, even in my own personal notions and what I'm writing on it, about it, you know, and some of their ancient memories and, you know, and some of their practices and stuff, this shit can be brought back out to the public, to the consciousness in this modern day and age. Uh you have plenty of people that are channeling knowledge concerning Atlantis and Lemuria and all those and Kingdom of Mu and what have you and how this worked and how that worked. Whether these were physically there or not, the knowledge is there. The memory is there. So whether it existed, whether it was like the Kingdom of a Dome here upon this earth that was like a legit thing that there's proof of. Uh, Atlantis was written about by, by Plato, but I mean... You know, there's, you know, no one's really found any proof about its civilization, few markings, so forth and so on. History tales. What if it was like an uh, interdimensional uh, space plane that existed in an area, you know, and that whole but beneath the sea, you know, it was ported over into another dimension or whatever. And this is me going out there on a limb with it. I'm not being serious. I'm just... I am open-minded enough to understand that it could it could exist on a on an alternate plane or in a you know an alternative dimension or that maybe hell maybe it was physical maybe we haven't found it because it's been covered up by not just the ocean but by you know mountains and lands that have then been covered with water you know we might never discover that until the water clears and the land is is mowed or cleared away I mean who knows but the concept is is that if you look at these similarities. There, there is memory there, whether it's false or whether it's real, but the knowledge is there, and people are getting results from connecting with that uh, ancestral memory. You know, and it's no different than when people sit there and say, oh, well, this book's real and this book's not, you know. And, it, and it's funny what people take to be truth or just made up. If an author writes about it, and enough people do, and, and everybody writes all these books, oh, well, if it come out of a book, it's true. But if I'm sitting there, I'm talking something, well, hell, you know, it didn't come out of a book where you getting this. I'm like, dude, everything came from mind before it ever hit paper. And, you know, then and this is the day and age we're living in, is people are not necessarily in denial, but they're too busy dissecting, oh, well, you know, because it wasn't wrote about, it's not real. Or because, you know, this person wrote about it from this point of view and somebody put it in the game. I'm like, dude, games were crafted around reality, 
way before reality was crafted around games. Yeah. So you, you bitches need to settle down, shut the fuck up, and let the adults talk. You made a very good point earlier about if you don't use your soul, someone else will will use it. Um, a lot of people look yep. on the fractal with the mind control that's going on. You don't use your mind, someone else can use the mind. Everyone just fucking believe in everything on fucking TV or news media or whatever the fuck some government tells them without questioning what well, goes up the fractal there, you know? Souls are... You know, it's like, I don't believe I don't believe Jesus was a bad guy. I think Jesus was the coolest motherfucker ever. He went in ra uh, raising hell and doing it his way. He was putting the power in people's hands. That wasn't a rebellious spirit in action. I don't know what was. Goes into a temple, overturns the tables of the money lenders saying that he's made this holy place a den of thieves. Holy crap, dude, that's what the church has become as a den of thieves, you know. They pass that offer oh, plate around, put your money in the box, put your money in the box. I'm like, bitch, I'm going to to a strip joint and I'm going to put a dollar in the box for reals, for reals. I think of it this way, there's, 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 it's a McDonald's spirituality for masses, for, designed for mass consumption. You go to the McDonald's of, of spirituality when you go to the church, mosque, or the synagogue. Occasionally, they let you have a Wendy's for a little bit smarter people. And that's what we call organized occultism. But so many don't know how fucking deep the occult actually goes. And see, and for those listening, I don't necessarily, I mean, I believe in Jesus. I'm actually on the fence whether Jesus was real or not. I do have concepts. I think that Jesus, if Jesus was real, was a fucking rebel, just like Lucifer. And I think that if Jesus was real, he was well trained in the ancient ways of the priesthood, the ancient priesthood, not this religious priesthood crap. Went here, there, and everywhere, learning all this really cool, neat, uh, arcane shit. And the thing about it is, that would make him the most badass magician ever. And that's if he were real. If he wasn't, hey, it's a really nice, fictitious uh, being in my head. And, you know, after thousands of years of people believing in him, guess what? He's real on the astral. So many thought forms created that to for that thought form. And he is just as forgiven and just as cool. And I ain't never heard one time about how I'm no damn sinner. And fuck these motherfuckers say sin this and sin that. I was watching a live stream the other day and I was in it. And this motherfucker talking about some sin. I was like, dude, the only sin I know of is, a, is the moon god sin. And it's pronounced sin. Uh, but if you want to believe in sin, you go right ahead. See, and that's the problem with this modern day and age is that all the shit that we've been taught, programmed into our heads, you know, we've adopted it. Fuck that, man. Fuck that. I, you know what? Be, be the rebellious one. Be, be Lucifer. You know, rebel against this bullshit. You know, be like a bleach. I refuse to bow before this man of clay. Because he ain't shit without me. With, without me, he'll never become hardened and strong enough to withstand anything. You know? And that's how you got to be about your life and about your own spirituality and your own mind. You you have to be just that way. I fucking love this. Fucking awesome, amazing words. Just a couple more questions before we wrap this up. This. Yeah. Uh, is it possible, you said earlier that night, if these old ones or greater ones don't feed, they can starve the... To death, and that's part of the reason why they created the show Goss and maybe even the Cosmos to, uh, to harvest it one day. Well, see, so you, okay, you know how bears hibernate? Yeah. Okay, well, the sleep of ages is no different. You know, they, they conserve their strength and their energy. Uh, I've noticed that everything that's upon the earth, I can't say anything about the universe because... You know, despite constellations and movement and some stars burning out and all this, that, and the other, you know, who knows about the totality of that. But you can look at everything upon the earth as being symbolic to what happens uh, within their things. So, like, uh, for example, it's not because of us that they do that. It's not a human thing, uh, you know, a human concept of, you know, we're trying to rationalize it. It's not like that. But where do you think animals, certain animals, got the idea, hey, during this time of year, I need to fly to where it's warmer? You say, oh, well, that's because they're cold-blooded or blah, blah, blah. No, that don't fully answer that one. 
you talk about animals that, you know, hibernate because, you know, they know there's not enough food or whatever during the winter times of the year. So they sleep through it till, you know, everything's moving around and so forth and so on. Where do you think these cycles, these cycles were created from the great old ones? You know, that's where it originated. That's where it came from. We're just a living mimicry of it. Remember, we are the microcosm of the macrocosm. And this is how you combine everything that uh, mysticism or magic or uh, the mysteries of witchcraft or occult. This is where all this shit comes from. It's just from viewing nature itself and realizing that it's actually part of something much larger and that it was crafted from something that had much deeper, uh, far-reaching purposes. Because I'm pretty sure those things... I'm not saying that some of them haven't died out or been aged or whatever the fuck, but what I'm saying is is that there's a continuation of species, and it's going to happen on any level. And if you believe that energy can neither can be neither created nor destroyed, then you've got to understand they're just changing up from one form to the next, whether it's being devoured or whether you know it's being created. Because if they don't continue to eat or exist, they'll just return back to the void where they came from. Kind of like... Uh, sort of, sort of, kind of. They become a part of what they're surrounded by, if that makes any sense. Everything, I think, wants to exist, even the dark, even even the old ones and, like, their, their children, the dark ones. They want to continue to exist to what they're doing, you know, even they're trying to pull themselves into the solar kingdom in sort of way in their own evolutionary trajectory. Yeah, I agree. Now my last question here before we wrap this up here, um, I wanted you to go again to um Azathoth and its planetary correspondence with Pluto and <laughs> What was the first Pluto? Where did the Pluto? Because so many people out there, they 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 get in the astrology. They think that Saturn is the king of the gods. Because, oh, Mercury is the close to the sun. That's why they call it Quicksilver. It's got the shortest orbit. Saturn is the farthest out from the sun, and they has the largest orbit. It's all encompassing. No, no, wrong. It's Pluto that actually has the largest orbit. It encompasses all the other planets. The uh, that w yeah, that we're aware of, because uh, even beyond the belt, there might be further planets that are literally encircling even that, but from what we understand and what we know to exist right now, uh, so the concept that I was putting out there to you was that if you think of the sun as a centerpiece, you would think that it's the source by which all these things are orbiting due to gravitation gravitational pulls, so forth and so on. But if you're looking at astrologically, Pluto has like, it, it takes the longest for it to make its orbit. Like something like a couple hundred years for it to make a complete circuit around the sun. The thing is, is that it has the greatest control over everything between it and the source. And the center source is actually like the secret heart uh, or the secret essence of, of, uh, as a thought, as Pluto, or we'll just stick with planetary here. The secret heart of Pluto is the sun because it's the furthest, it's the coldest, but its warmth is so far away. But its warmth also controls everything else between it and its heart. So everything between Pluto and the sun is literally under the dominion of, uh, as a thought, as Pluto. And, and that's just a symbolic uh, representation. Yeah. It's not literally that Pluto is as a thought. No, it's, it's, this is how you deepen your, this is how you open your mind up further to understand the concept so that you can even entertain the notion of connecting with a consciousness like as a thought. Now, didn't, didn't Lovecraft have an outer planet? I, um, that was even yeah. outside of Pluto. Well, I don't, I don't know if it was H.P. Lovecraft. I don't remember, but some people keep going on and on about Nibiru and all this other stuff. I think it was and it's Ugoth supposed to or something. Ugoth. Yeah. Something as the, uh, as the outer, as the ex-Plutonian planet. 
Yeah, well, see, it's like I was telling you, uh, Uranus, I see his Yarks of Thoth, Neptune, I see his Nihilokhotep, and Pluto as being the uh, secret gateway into Azathoth. Uh, and, and, it, and it makes sense once you get past the seven inner planets, the ones that are the formulators, the ones that, that are responsible for the crafting and creation and the cycle of things. And you got, uh, like I was saying, you have Uranus, Neptune, Pluto. You know, Uranus, uh, as Yogg is the, is the gate. You know, he's the key in the gate, blah, blah, blah. You know, so he expands our understanding past the seven, past the natural order of things. And you come to, you, you come to Neptune, Neptune with, you know, not a low tip. You got to understand that that's, you know, that's even further outside. It lies right between the gate. Which is Yarksathon, and the mind, which is Azathoth, is Pluto. You know, so so Pluto, being the great orchestrator that's crafted all this, you know, in between him and the gate is Nyarlathotep, and Nyarlathotep is like uh, he, he's like the emissary. He's like the one that decrees the council that goes forth into the kings and says, "Hey, my master's coming. Be prepared." Type shit, you know. Because think about it, every time Pluto uh, comes within a certain range or any of this other stuff, man, major, major fucking shit happens. That doesn't happen with any other ones. The other ones have, like, lesser degrees of influence. The further out you go, the greater the influence. I'm I'm pretty um, pretty newbie when it comes to, like, planetary astrology, but what kind of shit does Pluto cause or Pluto controls over? (sighs) Oh, well, Pluto's like for greater cosmic shit, like, for example, usually the downfall of kingdoms and so forth and so on. Uh, and also the establishment uh, and reign of great change, great change, not just simple change. Like, we can look at uh, at all the shit that's been happening in the last year or something. I mean, look at these snows and the storms and shit coming in behind it. Ebola popping back up. <laughs> Holy crap, I mean... Dude, this is like a murder hornets on crack. You know, you have a pandemic, this, this, you know, storm coming. And, and we're talking about just the United States. We're not talking about the whole world. But you got the pandemic, you know, stuff like that that affects the entire fucking world. Dude, that, that's, that's, that's just, you know, that, that's the kind of big thing that we're talking about with Pluto. Okay, and you said um, in the previous comment that Pluto was the most um, seen by the ancients, the most cold and unforgiving and unloving. Oh yes, yes, the absolutely, the coldest and cruelest. It's like tough yeah, because it, fucking, because it was so far man, from the sun, it Pluto had no warmth. It was like tough, shit, and it was you know, we're fucking yeah. ending this empire, we're fucking killing this king, we're fucking installing this new regime, and all this uh, yeah. meteor meteor hitting earth and shit like that, you know. Yeah. It's, uh, it's watched, uh, <laughs> oh, it's watched the age of earth carefully. I mean, you gotta understand from the, from the time everything settled, you know, they say that, uh, the thing cast the furthest was the first thing made, if that makes any sense. So when the sun was formulated and exploded and all these pieces that were going to become planets, Pluto would have been the first thing. That's why it flew the furthest before it settled. You know, that's if you're not taking into account the Nibiru, because that just depends on your take on the Nibiru, whether you think it exists, did exist, but doesn't exist, or whether it's invisible and hidden because it's so far away, it's so dark, it can't be, it can't be calculated or monitored by technology. I don't know. Last, last question. Do you think there's anything beyond even, like, Azathoth? Or do you think that is, like, the end-all, be-all? I'm going to be honest with you. I think if there is anything beyond Azathoth, I don't think any of us in our right minds would want to fucking know. Because you got to imagine a being of that magnitude. But then you also have to look at it on another hand. What if that is something that we ultimately can ever ascertain or attain to? 
And then again, you know, you look at the fact that, you know, whether Azathoth was self-made, self-begotten, whatever the fuck, uh, and crafted the void, or that its being is the void itself. Is there another void? You know what I'm saying? It's not exactly connected with Azathoth's uh, consciousness being the void. Dude, they don't know. No telling. It's like playing a... Uh, it's like playing a game of chess where all of creation are the chess pieces, and there's one guy sitting there playing himself. I'm going to have to just throw this out there, and because true initiation never ends, soul evolution never ends, there is no arrival point with this shit. The fractal... Oh yeah, there's no beginning and no end, brother. I, I'm just going to fucking say that there mu by that law, there must be something greater than Azathoth. There absolutely must be. But even then, we are, our language can't even give it a name, can't even, like, give it anything, any concept, not even a thought about it. Not even or what if the it. reason, or what if the reason why, uh, if, if, if it is as the problem, okay, I'm just throwing this out there, if it is as, if the void is as a thought, uh, as a consciousness, and, and if you follow the structure of Azathoth is dreaming all things, uh, what if Azathoth, uh, not necessarily in a human way of feeling alone or by themselves, but what if they are creating, uh, others like itself through its dreaming? And, you know, what if it takes trillions upon trillions upon trillions, eons, for somebody to to become likened unto as a thought. And see, that's awesome if you think about it. Once you get to that fucking level of thought, once you find that um, infinity within your soul, because really we are we are limitless, we are boundless, you can be done. You can make those gigantic leaps and bounds yeah. where like you can become like you 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 become deathless and self sustaining. You get you become like an old one or Maybe, maybe not right now, but maybe down the line, a couple of eternities, you might be coming as a person. Yeah, become like that, Th that's know? that's what I was saying. And he, here's an even, <laughs> an even crazier idea. I'm gonna go out there with this one. Sure. So, so if as a thought is dreaming and all this other stuff, uh, what if as a thought from even before or as a thought's consciousness, what if as a thought went through this same process? To become what Azathoth is now, as a as a void consciousness, and Someone taking the place of something much older than it, or following the example of something else that's like it. Because don't forget, we all be we are all made in the image of thing, and and in the end we become our own image, and then the other things that we've created are images of ourselves that take upon themselves their own image. Yeah, I mean, if you're following that frame of thought. Oh, I have seen, I, I, And that's about as far out there as I can get with you tonight, brother. Oh, I think that's more than fucking likely because all the signs point to it. I mean, I mean, why the gods and why, you know, the cultism and their, you know, um, they just, that we might even exceed them. That they're raising the next generation of gods. Fuck, even like Mormonism, which is the most boogaloo of the Christian cults, actually say that like if you're a good enough Mormon, you're gonna like you're gonna like have your own fucking planets to rule over, and you're gonna get to go down there as as Jesus and be those planets Jesus's. Yeah, I I try my best not to limit myself when it comes to like in my own personal magical practice. I don't sit there and think about necessarily just what others have wrote on the subject. I allow what they say to propel and to catapult my own consciousness to think deeper, to think more, to more outside the box. And uh, that's all I seek to do is just inspire others, inspire others to, uh, to get to that point within themselves and to teach them that the true power is within them and it's greater than they can comprehend. Because that's power. And when you teach somebody that, you're, take, you're taking and stripping away the authority others have over them, including uh, deities.
Oh, that's th- this was fucking great, man. Badass conversation. I love this. I enjoyed it, dude. Any any closing thoughts? You wanna you wanna put any plugs or anything in? No, I'm pretty brain dead by now, bro. <laughs> I mean, ring, I pretty much said it all, man. Websites, um, content. Oh, uh, yeah, uh, on YouTube, uh, the Black Tower, uh, on YouTube, uh, Black Tower on Facebook, of course. You can also, uh, I go by the Sorcerer Arm on a Soul, uh, most of the time. But you can find me on, uh, Facebook under Waylon Straczynski. That last name's a mouthful, but, you know. And I'm Mr. Goat here. You can find me right here at the Goat Scriptures there. And you can email me at goatlodgeprod at gmail.com for any questions, comments, or concerns. There, video, submit a video topic. You want to schedule an interview. You want to be on my show or something like that. We can make it happen. Oh, yeah. I appreciate you having me on here tonight, brother. No fucking problem, man. Take care now. Oh, yeah.